So good evening and a very warm welcome to the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh um, for this joint uh, event with the Scottish uh, Cancer Foundation. So my name's John Ball, I'm the, the president of the RSE. Probably you all know roughly what the RSE is, but it's Scotland's National Academy. We have approximately 1,800 uh, fellows from all, all walks of intellectual life in, 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 in Scotland. Uh, there's a small piece of housekeeping um, which is essentially there. So in, in the unlikely event of a, an emergency, you follow the instructions of the RSE staff and you go out into the freezing cold and you, and you catch pneumonia in front of the dome, uh, dome restaurant on the, on the right. Um, so uh, this evening, we're, we're delighted to, to welcome Dr. Elisabetta Vidapass uh, um, and to properly introduce her and to chair the uh, rest of the session. It's my honor to also introduce uh, Professor Bob Steele, who is a clinical research professor in surgery and health screening from the University of Dundee. So over to you. Well, well thank you very much, uh, John. So tonight's event is the annual Scottish Cancer Foundation lecture which has been a re regular event hosted here at the RSE for uh, quite a number of years. Um, we have a smaller audience than usual, uh, it would appear, but uh, I'm told that we have about 70 uh, people online. One of the problems with uh, offering an online option is if it's a cold night, people tend to stay at home. <laughs> but So thank you, those of you who are, who are here, for braving the... Uh, the uh, incipient Scottish winter and, uh, and being here uh, face to face. So just a quick word about the Scottish Cancer Foundation. It is a small but growing charity which was founded in the mid-1990s by um, Professor uh, Sir Patrick Forrest and Professor John Evans. And it, uh, it is the I'm pretty sure it, uh, it's fair to say it is the only charity, certainly in Scotland, that focuses primarily on cancer prevention. So our main activity is to fund research into cancer prevention, uh, and we are actively fundraising uh, for this at the moment. And if you want to find out any more about that, then if you put Scottish Cancer Foundation into Google, you will uh, find out uh, what we do. But uh, we are also very dedicated towards um, public engagement. And uh, this lecture is part of our drive to try to spread the word about how cancer can be prevented. So as I'm sure you're all aware, cancer is an enormous problem worth worldwide, and I'm sure our lecturer will, will touch on this. And one of our previous lecturers, Chris Wilde, uh, famously said that we cannot treat our way out of this problem. Now, Chris was director of the International Agency for Cancer Research, which is uh, the cancer research branch of the, uh, the World Health Organization. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be able to uh, invite uh, the current director of uh, the agency, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wiederpass, uh, as our lecturer uh, this evening. There is no one that uh, I believe worldwide who is better suited to address the uh, issue or the topic of how research can be brought to bear on cancer prevention because I'm, as I'm sure we'll hear, Dr. Vera Pass uh, was and is uh, an active researcher uh, as well as uh, uh, the uh, running IARC. And uh, so without uh, more ado, I, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vida Pass to deliver her uh, talk on uh, cancer research for cancer prevention. We will have a discussion at the end uh, of the, uh, the, um, uh, the lecture and people online will also have a chance to uh, ask questions. So Dr. Vida Pass, please. Good evening, colleagues, friends uh, here and online. It's really a pleasure for me to, to, to visit Edinburgh and to speak to you today. In particular, I would like to thank Professor Robert Stilp for inviting me and to give this annual lecture. 
uh, in partnership with the Scottish Cancer Society. I'm going to speak about IARC's mission, Cancer Research for Cancer Prevention, and I will illustrate with examples of research that we do and others do and that we work with and that we try to disseminate. So here is the outline of my, my talk today, an introduction to IARC's mission, an overview of the global cancer burden now and projection, projections until 2040. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about the main cancer risk factors and how we evaluate the, if something, an exposure, for example, is carcinogenic to humans or not in the, what we call the IARC monographs program. Then I, I'm going to talk about the potential for cancer prevention. How much cancer can we prevent in Scotland, in Europe, and worldwide? And I will end up with some take-home messages. So first, a few words about IARC and our mission. So we have a quite unique dual position as an independent research agency, independent from vested interests. We don't work with the, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry or other industries that make money selling products to, to patients, for example. But we are also the specialized research agency of the World Health Organization within the United Nations system. So uh, we are a part of WHO, but independent of it. That means our, our budget and our employees are employed by us, not by WHO directly, but we work together. So we were established in 1965, by seven countries, and the UK was one of the countries that started IARC. It was in the mood of the, the post-Second uh, World War, where multilateralism was still something rather fashionable. I think to some extent now people are more skeptical about it. But in that mood, seven countries put their efforts and their money together to create this organization that aimed to, cr to cross-fertilize research in different countries and help countries to work together. So one of the particularities that we have is that we do a lot of uh, projects in low- and middle-income countries. And why we do that? Because these countries have less researchers, have less resources, and have a huge uh, uh, challenge into identifying causes of cancer, but also planning preventative measures on the ground and providing services. So how, the, how is our relationship with WHO? So we are part of WHO, but we are separated. We have our own building. We are based in Lyon, WHO headquarters in, in Geneva. So what is this relationship with WHO? So we work quite closely together, but we, the International Agency of Research on Cancer, does research. We don't do policy. So we let policy for WHO to make. So advice to governments, and we have to, the honor to have a former uh, Minister of Health here. So the guidelines for countries to implement activities on the ground, is, that's WHO. What IARC does, we do the research and we provide the evidence base for WHO then to write recommendations and guidelines for government. So the roles are very clear and I don't mix in advising governments directly. Not I, but IARC per se. So have, let us have a look now in the recent global epidemiological data that we produce. So one of our main activities is to produce global statistics on cancer and identify trends, which cancers are increasing, which cancers are decreasing, why they are increasing, why they are decreasing, and what can be behind it. So here I will show you data from 2020 and actually very soon we will have data from 2022, but today I will still for simplicity just show data from 2020. There is not a big change in any case. So what we found in, the, in this publication that we, we did a couple of years back is that cancer and cardiovascular diseases are the leading causes of premature death in 127 countries in the world. All the countries countries in light blue and dark blue, they have either cancer or cardiovascular disease as the main cancer cause of premature death. How do we define premature death? Those are defined by the UN as deaths occurring before age 70. So we can question if this definition is outdated 
probabilities, but that's the definition that we use for the time being. So cardiovascular disease were the leading cause of death, in, uh, premature death in 70 countries, including very large countries such as Brazil, India, and cancer was the leading cause of mortality in 57 countries, including most of Western Europe, in North America, Australia, and China. In 50 other countries, including most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, cancer and CVD were among the three most common causes of premature death. There were only six countries in dark red in this figure, where neither cancer nor cardiovascular disease were among the three most common causes of premature deaths. And based on the trends, what we know as a fact is that cancer will overtake cardio cardiovascular disease as the leading cause of premature death in most countries in the course of this century. So in, in England, I believe that's already the case for uh, ages below 70. So where do we stand in terms of cancer incidence in the world and what are the predictions for the future? So as said, cancer will be the main challenge for health for all countries in the world in the, from now until the end of this uh, century. We have in 2020 about 19 million cancer cases and 10 million cancer deaths. So twice as many cases as we have cancer deaths. And more than 50 million, 50 million people are living with a cancer diagnosis in the world today. That's huge. It's a very large number of, of uh, patients which are undergoing uh, treatment for cancer or are just recovering from treatment. Cancer does not affect the, the world population in the same way. And the figure in these slides presents the distribution of cancer incidence and mortality according to the different world regions. So over half of the cancer cases and 60% of cancer deaths occurred in Asia, where about 60% of the world population resides. Europe, we have less than 10% of the global population, but we have almost 23% of all cancer cases and about 20% of all cancer deaths. So of all countries in the world, Europe is disproportionately affected by cancer incidence and mortality. There are many explanations for that, and one of the main explanations is the age distribution. Europe is a, is a country where the population pyramid is a little bit inverted. There are many elderly persons, persons who are aged more than 65 years old, where in other continents, in Africa and Asia, the pyramid is the other way around. There are much more younger people than we have in Europe. In, uh, Europe is followed by the Americas, where we have about 21% of incidence and 14% of mortality. So if you look at the incidence and mortality percentages, you will see that the, if you divide one by the other, it's not the same across continents. And in the US, they have less mortality, they have about the same incidence, the same number of new cases, but less mortality. And we can discuss later on why is that, because it's quite puzzling that there is such a difference between Europe and the US. Then Africa accounts for about 6% of the total cancer cases and 7% of the cancer deaths. So mortality in Africa is, is higher, proportionally speaking, than other continents. And in Asia as well, mortality is quite high compared to incidence. And this is because the types of cancers that are very common in Asia and Africa are more aggressive cancer types. So there are many cancer types for which we cannot diagnose early, or if, even if we can, there are no ways to do that in those populations, and treatment is not sufficiently effective. So globally, the number of new cancer cases is expected to increase quite a lot. I told you we have about 19.3 million, almost 20 million new cases in 2020, and by 2040, we will have almost 30 million new cases. That's really a lot. And our scientists also have evaluated how will be this evolution. And here, this is a complicated graphic because it is in logarithmic scale. But what we did, we classified countries 
according to the Human Development Index, which is a, a UN index which combines different parameters that basically measure how wealthy a country is, including the mean scholarity, the GDP, and so on and so forth. And then we classified countries according to low Human Development Index, medium, high, and very high. And what we observed is that the, the, the massive increase in the number of new cancer cases will occur in the poorest countries in the world, the countries with very low human development index. These countries are basically in sub-Saharan Africa, some countries in Asia, and some countries in Latin America. And these countries are not prepared at all for the tsunami of cases that will reach them in the next decades, in the, in, until 2040. So it's, it's, a, it's really an emergency, a public health emergency, to help these countries to do something about it. Because most populations, will, as per today, do not have sufficiently uh, means to, to tackle the, the disease. So what can we do? Many things, but the, the, the best buys that we, we call what is really extremely cost efficiently is prevention. And what can we do for prevention, which there is no question whatsoever, is prevents a large amount of cancer cases and is very, very cheap. HPV vaccination. HPV is an abbreviation that stands for human papilloma virus. This virus is a virus that probably Everyone in this room has been infected or is infected, but almost certainly were infected when we were teenagers or early, early adults, uh, in, at the, when we start our sexual life. It's a sexually transmitted virus. And usually it cleans up with age. The immune system is quite competent to get rid of the virus. But in a small percentage, percentage of people, the virus persists. And we, we more or less know why are differences in the immune system. And this virus causes cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is a cancer that is pretty much under control in Europe because we have screening and we have vaccination, but in low and middle income countries, it's not like that. And it's a very fatal disease. So vaccinating for HPV is one very cost effective measure that we strongly recommend to all countries in the world, even the poorest of the poorest countries. Tobacco control. Tobacco is still responsible for at least 20% of cancer cases in each and every country in the world, and in some countries is even more. We, we have known that tobacco causes cancer and kills about half of the users of tobacco for 70 years. And still, we have a very large proportion of people that smoke. It's one of the most addictive substances that we know of. So it causes connections in the brain that makes it extremely hard for people to stop smoking. And I, I'm sure that there are plenty of people in this room that have had the experience to eventually try to quit smoking, and it's very hard. Tobacco control, many things are effective. Most effective thing to do is price. Basically, the more you increase the price, the less people smoke. This is very solid science. There are lots of scientific articles indicating that. And then limitation of points of selling and limitation the age and availability of, of product. In other words, making the life of smokers really expensive and hard. And the more you do that, it works, people decrease smoking. The most important challenge here is not to let the new generations start smoking because they are very susceptible to addiction. And then alcohol drinking. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about alcohol drinking. It's something that people don't talk much about. And actually, many healthcare professionals and the general public are not aware of the impact of alcohol on cancer. Let's move now to mortality. As I told you before, we had about uh, 10 uh, million deaths per cancer in year 2020. And what is the, what's the pros prospects for 2040? We will have about 16.3 million. So it's also quite a substantial increase. And the greatest predi prediction of income, also the greater numbers that we will increase are also in, in very poor countries countries that have the low human development index. So they will have almost a doubling of the number of cancer deaths in the uh, next one to two decades. Again, so th these countries uh, need appropriate, affordable, and equitable 
access to, to diagnosis and treatment to, to make face to this pandemic in the next few years. So, all these studies also provide a quite a lot of information um, on different types of cancer in different regions of the world and, and then tools and, and uh, information on what can we do to prevent it and to reverse the trends. And this graph, it's about lung cancer. So lung cancer is really number one in terms of cancer mortality in many countries, in 93 countries out of 185 countries that we have data uh, at IARC, lung cancer is number one uh, in the world. How do we do that? Actually, we work with all these countries. So we, the, in these 185 countries, we have contacts with the cancer registries. We go to the countries or we work remotely and we collect data. We standardize in a way that's comparable across populations and then we publish these statistics and we have an interactive database that any of you can assess, is free of charge, and can play around with the maps, with the graphs, with the trends to understand better what is what's information we have, how the trends look like, and what we, uh, we, what we can do about it. And what we, we see in the top, we have males, and in the bottom, we have females. So lung cancer is really uh, devastating. And again, we know what to do about it. We, we know that we need to make people is, stop smoking, and for that, we need to change the laws and regulations, we need to increase price, and we need to decrease accessibility, because the numbers of deaths are just staggering. It's a little bit more in men than in women, because women started smoking a few years later than men, Choose the pandemic is catching up with women a few years later. But in many countries, the cancer incidence and consequently mortality for lung cancer is increasing rather than decrease. In many countries, among men, lung cancer is decreasing, but in women is not the case. So this is about the avoidable deaths that we can do, uh, we can have in, in terms of prevention uh, worldwide. And we have calculated this as well. So if we use all the knowledge that we have today, how many lives can we save? And what we found is that actually half of all cancer deaths that occur prematurely before age of 70, representing 183 million years of life lost, can be avoided. If we just implement, as we already know today, we should do to prevent cancer. And most of these deaths, 60-80% of them, can be prevented by what we call primary prevention. And what that means? Avoiding exposing people to non-risk factors. Smoking, alcohol, uh, diet, which is an inappropriate, uh, physical uh, inactivity and overweight or obesity are the main risk factors that we are talking about, but also air pollution and exposure to environmental uh, pollutants. And one third of these avoidable deaths are for cancers actually that we can detect and treat early. So, but the bulk of the prevention of mortality we can reach by prevention of exposures rather than by treatment which is something that most people actually are not aware of. So I'm talking a lot about prevention, and many of you might be asking yourself, so what, I mean, there are so many different types of cancer, so what we know about these different types of cancer and how much of each of them uh, can be really uh, pre prevented in, in, in different ways. And this data here, is from the UK, and this is a study is from a UK researcher was published in 2018. And he divided the different cancer types according to those that we know that between 75 and 100% are preventable, 24 to 27% preventable, or less than 25% preventable, according to the knowledge that we had until 2018. And this is, this is so what, what we found. For cervical cancer, 100% can be preventable with H human papillomavirus vaccination and the screening and early detection. Lung cancer, 90% can be preventable. 
80% due to smoking, not smoking or smoking cessation, and 10% due to avoiding occupational exposures to carcinogenic substances and to air pollution. For oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, 90% preventable. Smoking and alcohol are alone or combined. For esophageal cancer, 90% preventable. Avoidance of smoking, alcohol, together uh, or separately, and avoiding, avoiding excess weight. For melanoma of the skin, at least 75%, in many countries, 80 to 90% can be preventable by avoiding excessive UV solar radiation. It's, it's avoiding exposing your skin to too much sunshine. Stomach cancer, 75% preventable. And what causes stomach cancer? Excess of consumption of salt and salt-preserved food, low consumption of fruits and vegetables, alcohol smoking, and cigarette smoking. Then for the cancers, which are in the middle, 25 uh, to 75% that can be preventable. For colon and rectal cancer, 55%. And what causes it mostly? Diet poor in whole grain and cereals, fruits and vegetables, consumption of meat and meat products, what we call processed meat, which is all the meat with a lot of chemical additives, like you having sausages, salami, and this sort of uh, foods, where meat foods. Alcohol consumption, lack of physical activity, and overweight and obesity. For bladder cancer, 40% preventable. And this is smoking and occupational exposures, as well as radiation, which are the main uh, risk factors. Kidney cancer, 40% preventable, mainly due to smoking and excess body weight. Liver cancer, 40% preventable. Alcohol, chronic infections, fatty liver disease, and cirrhosis are, are the main causes. Breast cancer, particularly after menopause, 25% preventable. Many women have no clue that breast cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, can be preventable. Excess weight is a cause, lack of physical activity, but importantly, alcohol consumption is directly linked to postmenopausal breast cancer. And also for women that have had children but have not had the opportunity to breastfeed or choose not to breastfeed, that increases also the risk of breast cancer. And then for the last category, which are the cancers that we know today that probably less than 25% are preventable. We have ovarian cancer. The only, the only concrete thing that I think we know as a fact that can decrease the risk of ovarian cancer is use of hormonal oral contraceptives. That decreases the risk quite dramatically. Leukemias, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, it's a type of lymphoma prostate cancer, and that's a major challenge because prostate cancer is extremely common, and brain tumors. There is a lack of data on this last category here, and a little bit more studies are needed for, so that we can understand more which are the risk factors for these cancers and how they can be prevented. So what are... Uh, so we, we, we looked at different cancers, types now together, and then... I want to go a little bit in depth so, uh, with some of the main risk factors that you certainly have heard before, but uh, how important they are. And what is what we call the population attributable fraction to these risk factors. Population attributable factor means the following. Of 100 people that got a certain cancer type, let's say breast cancer, which is the proportion of that, those cases of cancer which are, are explained by a exposure X. That's what we call population attributable uh, fraction. And here, uh, we, we have done a study in France, and, and that's the example that I have on the, on the left hand. And we, di we looked at different risk factors for France. And what our conclusion was, is smoking is responsible for 20% of all cancers in, in France, alcohol consumption, 8%, unbalanced diet, 5.4%, excess body weight and obesity, 5.4%, and inf infections, 4%, uh, 
and occupational exposures, 3.6, almost 4%. When we sum up this all together, it's about 41% of all cancer cases in France that are attributed to these risk factors. And that means, I mean, cancer, uh, France has had, in, in the year we did this study, 346,000 cancer cases. That means that 142,000 cases could have been avoided. So then we also extrapolate data for Europe, for Europe 27, and our estimates indicate that 1.3 million cancer cases, 30, 30%, 33% among men and 44% in women are preventable if prevention policies in the best performing countries in Europe would be applied through all other European countries. So if we would just cut and paste the policies that we know that work and that are feasible to implement in some countries that we would transplant to all European Union. So it becomes quite obvious that a, a cancer prevention strategy is needed for each and every country and that it's very serious because this is really lives of, of millions of people that we are, we are talking about here. So let's review now the findings on the proportion of attributable uh, cases for different risk factors. And let's start here with uh, alcohol consumption. So we estimated all together, and this is this part of the figure, that about per year it's about 741,000 new cancer cases associated with alcohol consumption. Men, uh, out of Four people that develop a cancer due to alcohol, three are men and one is, wom is women. And there are many cancer types which are caused by alcohol and they are listed in the, in the figure here. So it's esophagus, liver, breast, colon, oral cavity, rectum, pharynx and larynx. Many people are not aware of it. Or when people know that alcohol causes cancer, they think it's only very heavy drinking. And by heavy, I mean drinking more than two drinks a day. That's what, I, what we call in this study heavy. But actually, drinking much less than that is already associated with an increased cancer risk. What to do? Everyone, most people drink. People like to drink. There, there is a social role. The, the advice here is really is to decrease. The, uh, as much as possible. And the, the countries which are more progressive in their uh, advice now, I think it's Canada probably, and what they say is a maximum of two drinks, not per day, but per week. So it's, it's quite a dramatic reduction for what people were talking before until very, very recently, that was a maximum of two drinks per day for standard drinks per man. So the evidence shows that if you pass two drinks per week, your cancer risk is substantially increased for one of the uh, risk uh, for one of the cancer types listed here. In the map, the darker the color is how uh, it is the more the counties are affected by cancers related to alcohol, and you can see, of course, that there is a, a massive program, problem in in Russia, in China, in India but also in Western Europe. So this, these areas are quite affected, but it's throughout the, it's tr it's throughout the world. So there is, a, and there is a need also to, conv to inform and convince healthcare professionals, because there is a large part of healthcare professionals that still think that drinking alcohol decreases your risk of cardiovascular disease. That's a myth. Newer studies indicate that that's not correct. Some other people think that drinking a little bit decreases your risk of diabetes. Again, that's incorrect. So the new research indicates that's incorrect. So carry on drinking if you drink, but try to decrease as much as possible and to space it as much as possible. And if people don't drink, in particular the young generations, try to discourage as much as possible from starting drinking. So let's move now to obesity. And this is a figure for both sex combined uh, worldwide. And the figures are a little bit low, is about uh, old, is about 10 years old, but actually the picture just got worse rather than better. The darker the color, the more the countries are affected by cancer schools by obesity. And you can see it's a massive problem in North America, in Chile, 
in, in Europe, and in, in specific in some countries in, in Europe, but also in, in Russia and in Australia for uh, both sets combined. So what types of cancer are related to obesity? Breast cancer, postmenopausal. So breast cancer is the most common cancer type in women. For mortality, is between lung and breast, depending on which country, but for incidence, for new cancer cases, breast cancer is the most common. And obesity, overweight and obesity, is in really increases risk quite substantially. Then corpus uteri, or endometrial cancer, is the cancer of the lining of the uterus. That's also directly related to, uh, to obesity. Colon cancer, kidney cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreas cancer, and a mix of other types of cancer. And all together in the, in the world, now is over 500,000 new cancer cases attributed to obesity. So let's move now to uh, a little bit more detail about obesity. So obese people worldwide, 13, 1, 3, uh, uh, percent. So not overweight. Obese means what we call BMI, the body mass index, the division of your weight divided by your height is squared above 30, which means really substantial weight, 13 percent. And it's a little bit more in women than in men. So 15 percent in women, 11 percent of men. And all countries are affected, all continents are affected, and this year more people suffer from overweight and obesity than they suffer for underweight uh, or, or lack of food. So the main, until very recently, lack of food and thinness, let's say, was a, the major diet-related challenge worldwide. Now it's not. It's really obesity. In, in UK, is, uh, it has quite a challenge, so it's very high. It's about 30% now. And it's, it's uh, increasing. Uh, and there is no sign of the pandemic of obesity being controlled in any country in the world. No one has found a formula to control the, the pandemic. In some countries, it's very high. I mean, I was myself living in the Middle East in a, a few years back, and there people have up to 60% prevalence of obesity in the general population. So it's quite a massive problem. So what causes uh, obesity? Many things, and you know them as much as I do, but one thing that I think many people have not realized is what we call ultra-processed foods. What's ultra-processed foods? Basically, these are all the foods that you open a package and it contains something ready for you to eat and it can have a very long shelf life and has lots of chemicals added to it. So when you read the, la the label, you will find at least six, seven, ten 20 additives in it. So those types of foods, ultra-processed foods, are the main cause driving the obesity pandemic worldwide. And also the sugars, the sugars contained in, in uh, soft drinks and other free sugars that, that people consume in excess. Uh, Another thing that we have been studying a lot, and we have a whole group w working on it, is, in, is the impact on, of ultra-processed foods in the development of cancer. It is associated. It's not only that, you, that it causes obesity, but it also causes specific cancer types, in particularly colorectal cancer. And it di di uh, disturbs all your bacteria, the bacteria that people have in the normal gut, which is healthy bacteria. It changes completely the flora of the intestinal to the worst. And that's associated with many different types of, um, of diseases. So, among the nutritional foods, then the food processing is the new culprit, is, is the new uh, knowledge that we have now accumulating more and more that probably this should be controlled and should be limited. And the regulations for selling and having this food available, for instance, in schools and in public settings should be restricted. So we, ha we have done a study, and I don't expect you to understand all the details of this graph. It's, it's very complicated. But what we did here, we looked at substituting 10% of the processed foods with the equal amount of what we call 
minimally processed foods. These are the foods that do not contain uh, chemicals and that are not uh, treated in ways to have long shelf life. And we looked at the impact that this change would have in the incidence of different cancer sites. And we observed decreases in head and neck cancers, esophageal, cell carcinoma, colon cancer, rectal cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and postmenopausal breast cancer. This is quite an important message because, I mean, you do the shopping, right? You, sh you go to the supermarket every day and you can look at the, uh, at the back of the packages or front of the packages. I don't know where the labels are. And when you see lots of chemical substances that you don't know what they are, preservatives, additives, colorants, just don't buy it because it's, it's pretty clear that if you decrease the ingestion of those substances, your cancer risk uh, also will decrease. Let's move now to infections. So infections cause cancer. And we know now pretty much uh, some of the main, the most important infections that cause cancer. Helicobacter pylori, it, it's, a, it's a bacteria which, which causes stomach cancer. Human papilloma virus causes cervical cancer in women, but also causes cancer in men of the uh, larynx and, and pharynx and others, and also causes other cancers in the geni genital area in both men and women and anal cancer, in particularly in HIV positive people, people that are slightly immunosuppressed and men that have sex with men. Human papillomavirus, about 30% of all inf cancers related to infection. Hepatitis B infection, which is preventable by vaccination, an hepatitis C infection, which is not preventable by vaccination, we still don't have a vaccine, but we know today how to treat it quite effectively, and other agents. So all together, if we put all these causes together, it's about 2.2 million new cancer cases per year which are attributed to infectious disease. If you remember, I told you that we have about 20 million cancer cases uh, per year, so it's a little bit more than 10, it's 12% 12, 12 of all cancer cases are, are caused by infectious diseases. Infectious diseases affect more certain countries in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, China. China is responsible for 20% of all, 20% all, of all these numbers are in, in China. So they are very much affected. And the, in the map, the principle is always the same. The darker the color, the more affected the regions of the world are for these specific risk factors. Let's move on now for something, something else. How do we know that a substance or an exposure causes cancer? We, can, we have studies in animal models. In rodents, for example, we have also studies that we do in petri dishes and other laboratory techniques, and we have studies in humans, right? So there is a whole bulk of literature. There, there are many studies published every day and throughout the years. But this, all this literature needs to be put together in a coherent way with a methodology that evaluates it all and makes sense of it all. Because some studies show results in one direction and some studies uh, show results in other direction. And at IARC, there is a program which is called IARC Monographs for Hazard Classification. And this is a methodology that was created about 50 years ago to make sense of all the scientific literature on animal models, cell models, and humans. So this program evaluates chemicals, complex mixtures, occupational exposures, physical, biological agents, pharmaceuticals, and other factors, example, tobacco smoking, which are suspected to cause cancer. So we only evaluate things that we believe are most likely or we suspect it that might be related to cancer. So agents to be evaluated are recommended for hazard evaluation when there is evidence that people might be exposed and there, there are at least some articles that indicate carcinogenicity. There are working groups of experts, so we, we usually select the people who are actively publishing a specific domain and we invite them to review the literature together with us in using a very, very uh, standardized methodology. 
And this exercise then results in the classification that it has four levels. Group one is carcinogenic to humans. Group 2A is probably carcinogenic to humans. Group 2B is possibly carcinogenic to humans, and there is a difference between probably and possibly. And group 3 is not classifiable to its carcinogenicity to humans. Note that is not, uh, this evaluation indicates how strong is the scientific evidence of a substance causing cancer. So it takes in, in consideration the quantity and the quality of the studies. So just a few examples of each substance so that you, that you understand the, the next examples that I will give to you after. So group one carcinogenics, we know for sure. There is no doubt whatsoever that they, there is sufficient evidence for cancer. Examples, tobacco smoking, solar radiation, consumption of alcoholic beverages, and the exposure to ionizing radiation. Probably carcinogenic to humans. Emissions from high temperature frying, DDT is a pesticide used in the control of mal malaria, for example. Consumption of red meat, yes, it causes cancer, unfortunately, and night shift work. So most probably, these are causing cancer in humans. There is, there is limited evidence in humans, but there is sufficient evidence in experiment, laboratory experimentals and in animals. Possibly carcinogenic to humans, examples, gasoline engine exhaust, occupational exposure as a hairdresser or barber, and exposures to lead. And substances that we don't have enough evidence, coffee drinking, crude oil exposure, mercury, and paracetamol. So, an illustration that maybe you have heard about, about these evaluations. It was the assessment that we did uh, this year on the impact of, of non-sugar sweetener aspartame that we uh, published in July. And then the FAO, the, the Food and Agric Agriculture Organization, has a committee which is called Joint Expert Committee on Food Addictives. They also evaluated the maximum limit that people should be uh, consuming safely. So the, the roles of IARC and the FAO are very different, but they are complementary. So IARC evaluates, is there evidence that the substance causes cancer? And then the FAO evaluate how much you need to consume to get a cancer. So our conclusion of IARC was that aspartame is possibly carcinogenic to humans, group 2B based on limited evidence for carcinogenicity in humans, and FAO, or JECFA, the committee, reaffirmed that, okay, it is carcinogenic, but you can still consume up to a certain level, and that level is 40 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day. That's very complicated. That would be the equivalent for an adult person of eight cans of coca diet per day. That's a lot, but it's not a lot for a child. If you think that a child has a much lower body weight, has less muscle, has, has less, so if, if a child drinks or eats a lot of sweeteners, that increases cancer risk substantially. So these findings were published in Lancet Oncology, which is a very important medical journal, which is published in, in, in the UK. And the whole, the whole book with the whole, the, all the data, all the studies that we, we summarized, will we be published in 2024. So let me give you another example, and this example is from today. So actually, yesterday evening at midnight, we published this. And it's, uh, you, if you have not heard about it, you certainly will in the days to come, because the journalists are just picking up on it. So these are the findings of the evaluation of a very difficult thing to pronounce, perfluo, perfluorooctanic acid, or PFOA, and perfluooctacelfonic acid, PFOS. If you don't know what this is about, ask yourself if you ever had a tefal, I should not say the commercial name, pan in your kitchen. 
So this is what Tefal and all the similar uh, companies used for example, in the coating of, uh, of things that we use in the kitchen. So it's these wonderful substances that avoid that your milk stick in the, <laughs> in the pan and that you fry things without needing oil. Uh, not now, because it's banned. These two substances are banned. But a few years ago, until 2009, they were all over the place. And I'm pretty sure everyone here is exposed. So these two substances are very widely used chemicals because they are very useful. And they are a large group of fluorinated compounds. Sometimes they are called forever chemicals because they do not degrade easily. PFOA and PFOS are ubiquitous presently in the environmental, even in the most remote areas. Antarctic, Arctic, etc. They have also been specifically found in a wide range of products such as food packaging, milk cartoons, carpets, because they avoid humidity and the, and the fat to stick in carpets, in the coating of furniture as well, building materials, cosmetics, cookware, waterproof cl clothing, so the jackets, the rain jackets, and fire, firefighting foam. It's a foam that firefighters use to extinguish uh, fire. And they have many industrial applications. So they have also been found, and that's the concerning part of it, in drinking water supplies, especially near sites where they are produced and used extensively. Currently, there are restrictions in place in some countries to use these two agents. And the general population is mainly exposed via contaminated water or food, which absorbs the water from, from ground or, or from the earth, because these, these contaminants are all over the place. And in some places, they're in very high concentra concentrations. And some occupations, like firefighters are, uh, that use phones or used to, to use phones, are highly exposure. So the PFOA was classified as carcinogenic to humans, group one, and the, uh, with sufficient evidence in experimental animals as well, and mechanistic evidence, uh, what we call the key characteristics of carcinogenesis. That means that the biology, the basic science, is pretty solid. So we are pretty much sure that this is, uh, this is a substance causing cancer. And then the PFOS, we classified as possibly carcinogenic to humans, group 2B, based on strong mechanistic evidence. That means the basic science stuff. But there was a limited number of studies in experimental animals, and there were no sufficient good quality of studies in humans. So the, the evidence for humans is inadequate. In the IARC website, the, in our agency, uh, there is a lot more of information. There are questions and answers about these two substances. There are also films that we put there and all the infographics, if anyone is interested. I'm pretty sure this will be coming in the newspapers uh, uh, very soon, probably in the next few days. So we are going to hear about it uh, more. So these substances were banned a uh, few years back, but they are still present all over. And the issue here is that we evaluated two substances, but there are more than 200 of the same family of substances. Why we did not evaluate the other 200 plus substances? Because there are not enough scientific studies to be evaluated. So we could only evaluate these two because there are sufficient literature to be evaluated. But there are many more, and they are all over. So, and this is quite concerning. So let's move now to something else. And we are, um, we are talking now about something more positive, which is implementation research. And this is something that we spend in our organization quite a lot of time doing. That means going to countries and testing evidence to prevent cancer and to screen and detect cancer early on the ground and seeing what the impact this have. And this study is a study on HPV, vac human papilloma virus vaccination in India, which is one of the countries with, with the higher number of women that develop cervical cancer and women that die of it. 
And what we did, we compare the number of doses of vaccination, one dose, two doses, and three doses in young girls, girls aged about 10 years old, and then we follow these girls for 10 years. And then we looked at the, uh, the duration of antibody response, and what we found, and you can see there, one dose, 90%, two doses, 92 almost 93%, and three doses, the same number, 92%. And the conclusion of this study is that giving one dose is probably sufficient for immunity for, girl, for young girls. And this is really a very important study for many reasons. It's a little bit, if you think about the, the, the COVID vaccine, right? We got several doses of COVID vaccine. You think about the amount of money that costs, the logistics, and all the complexities, potential side effects, and so on and so forth. So this study is very important because in the, it indicates that with the doses that we were paying or the world was paying quite a fortune to produce and to, in, to invest, we can decrease investments or we can, in, we can use the investments to vaccinate much, many more people. And this is, this is quite, it's quite a crucial study. And we uh, pu recently published that. And based in our studies, the UK changed their guidelines for vaccination. They are now using one dose as well here. And many European countries are following suit. And India has started vaccination for all girls, which is a massive uh, work because it's such a huge population. And then we also estimated together with the Indian government how many decades, because we talk about decades, it will take to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health disease in India. And it's about 50 years, so five decades. So I think in your lifetime, we will hopefully see one cancer type very much decrease and may be eliminated in some countries, and that's cervical cancer. And that's because of this vaccine, and which is now being used more and more uh, in, many, in many countries. So about implementation research on screening. So to help countries to, to evaluate the impact of screening, we have also created a database which we call CanScreen5, which is a repository of data on screening, uh, and, and so early detection and screening, to evaluate how are the countries doing in terms of implementing it and how we can benchmark the quantity of the quality of the programs ag against each other in different countries and in different regions. So we have data here for breast cancer, 57 countries, cervical cancer, 75 countries so far, colorectal cancer, 51 countries, and other programs which are subnational in, in for 84 more countries in, until this year. And this data is really very useful for ministries of health to understand if what they are doing on the ground is good enough or if they can improve and how much it would cost to improve it or if they should start, uh, if they have already capacity to implement new uh, cancer screening types. So these three cancer screening types are those that most countries are doing something about it, at least the rich countries. There are many other cancer types that maybe we can screen for, for example, lung, for example, uh, bladder cancer, prostate cancer, but the, the, the large scale programs, we don't have sufficient evidence to implement them full-fledged. This will come, hopefully, in the next years to come. Just an example for you, a different type of research that we do as well. And this is an this is, um, uh, example on social inequalities in cancer in Europe. So cancer is a disease that affects people very differently. And this study is a study on cancer-specific mortality by socioeconomic status that we measure according to educational level in 18 countries in Europe with multiple endpoints between 1990 and 2015. And what this study shows is that one in three cancer deaths in men and one in each six cancer deaths in women can be explained by educational inequalities. That means poor people dying unnecessarily. And why is that? 
basically it's exposure to risk factors. We know, unfortunately, that people with lower socioeconomic status are more exposed to a range of carcinogenic substances in the workplaces, at home, diet, and so on and so forth, but also that they have less access to screening, to early detection, and to treatment which is adequate even in countries that have universal access to healthcare. We see the same reality and we repeated the exercise to other regions of the world and we see the same pattern all over. So, and, it, and the inf information here is really important because it indicates that within each country and which region, we really need to have focus target groups where we invest more in cancer prevention and we facilitate access to healthcare because they are, they are very much affected by, the, by inequalities uh, of the disease. So effective implementation of preventive interventions also need to be communicated to stakeholders, to policymakers, and to general, to general public in, in a very clear and convincing way. And to disseminate in the, uh, the evidence about cancer prevention, risk factors, etc., the European Commission developed the European Code Against Cancer. And actually, this is not on, only a code, it's an interactive database that summarizes all the evidence, the scientific solid evidence, and what can prevent cancer. I don't expect you to read this code because it's quite extensive, but you can easily assess it. You just type in Google co European Code Against Cancer or Cancer Prevention and you will find it easily. And these are the measures that any person, any family can do to decrease those what we, we talk about 40% decreasing risk. That's what you should do. That's what you should follow. Some things are very difficult to implement, like avoiding overweight to obesity, but indicates at least the direction that you should implement to, to decrease uh, your risk. So this code has already been published in four editions, and we are now preparing the fifth edition together with, with uh, European partners. And this has been, uh, to some extent, successful because it helps communication, but not sufficiently successful, because if you ask healthcare professionals, they still don't know how to prevent cancer. And if you ask your neighbor that has not been in this lecture today, they don't know it either. So we still need a lot more of communication about how to prevent cancer. And to do that, I mean, we are, uh, we, we are developing uh, the fifth edition of this code, but we are also working in what we call a stepwise, in a world code against cancer, which we are adapting different recommendations which are specific to different regions of the world and in countries where there are specific risk factors which are more important, uh, bringing this to the, to the attention of, of people in that region uh, and also, of course, to, to ministers of health and, de and decision makers. And we have now very recently launched, developed and launched the Latin American Code Against Cancer. This was about two months ago or so, together with PAHO, which is the, uh, the Pan-American Health Organization, which covers all the region of the Americas. And it's, uh, it's quite different, in fact, from the European Code, because there are many risk factors which are specific for Latin America, including in terms of programmatic actions that were included in, in that code. And it was very interesting to see that there was a, a big interest by ministers of health uh, to work further in terms of implementing legislation to, to make uh, the right choice, the easiest choice for people in Latin America. We are doing the same exercise with countries in Asia, and we hope to do it in, in Africa and then combine this all in a worldwide code and disseminate it as much as we, we possibly can. So since we have the global mandate, we also try to, to generate uh, evidence on, on costs because I think we have a former minister here and I think that one of the difficulties is to, for, the, for ministries is to convince the Ministry of Economy to, to, uh, to make budget available for cancer prevention. And this slide indicates a little bit of the costs of cancer and here I took the example of, the, of Europe. 
and this is really quite substantial. So, for example, this is for 2018. It was uh, almost 200 billion uh, euros. In direct, direct costs, and by direct costs, we mean healthcare expenditure, about 103 billion, and other healthcare costs, 26 billion. But there are also indirect costs, which are productive loss from premature mortality and other morbidity, about 70 billion. And this represents about 5 to 6 percent of total health expenditure in Europe. This was in 2018. However, since then, uh, the costs of cancer treatment have skyrocketed because of the new therapies. So now that proportion is, is a little bit more, and it's increasing uh, by the day. So the new cancer therapies are really imposing a massive burden. It, they are a chance in many cases, but they also represent a massive challenge to, 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 uh, to, to ministers and to countries to support them and make them available. If we look globally, and this is, this is more recent data, is about 1.2 trillion US dollars per year. And if you, if you count from 2020 to 2015, it's 25 trillion uh, US dollars altogether. So it's, it's the figures are rather massive. If you divide how much cancer costs per year per citizen in Europe, and here we just listed the, the different European countries, not only for people with cancer, but for each person, including each child, each adult, each retired person, the costs vary a lot, but it's, it's uh, and the darker the color, the more money the countries spend with cancer, it, it varies from a little bit less than 200 euro to over 500 euro per citizen per year. So quite massive investment for, for countries. Okay, take home messages. So what we talked about, overall cancer incidence and mortality differs a lot between countries and within countries and they differ according to the Human Development Index, an index of wealth or poverty, and there is an inequality in the cancer, and in the, the countries which are the poorest are, have, are the ones that have a burden which is increasing, and it will be very difficult for them to cope with. All countries will have difficulties in coping with the cancer pandemic, but the poorer countries are really, really in trouble. So the greatest increases in incidence and mortality are expected to, in these countries where the, the healthcare is just not ready at all. And there are very low hanging fruits that must be implemented in all countries, but in particular in these countries that have uh, a burden which, which will become uh, too much to bear. And these are, for example, HPV vaccination, tobacco control, preventing exposures to adverse lifestyle factors, obesity, and ex in, in exposure to carcinogenic substances. And then assess to appropriate, affordable, and equitable treatment we, uh, will also be crucial in all countries in the world, but in particularly for the poorest countries in the world. And persuading nations worldwide to accelerate Resource-appropriate cancer control programs is a matter of urgent, particularly because we know that cancer affects some strata of the population that come late for diagnosis, come late for treatment, and have the poorer prognosis. And efforts to plan, implement, and evaluate prevention programs must be cons considered as a priority in all countries, and also in low- and middle-income countries where we have many challenges, uh, infectious disease, but now cancer is taking over as a very important uh, challenge. That was it for me. And uh, if we have a few more minutes, I would be delighted to entertain questions, comments, criticisms, and whatever you want to talk about. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Well, of course, uh, these lectures are um, a vehicle for discussion as well as for, uh, for education. 
So uh, we very much welcome the opportunity to, uh, to hear your questions. So uh, please have a seat. And, Thank you. Uh, we, um, we are, um, Dr. Viripas has kindly agreed to answer uh, any questions you might have, both from the audience here and from uh, people online. So uh, uh, please feel free to, to ask, please. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was struck by the um, last slide where you referred to um, the low-hanging fruit, and certainly HPV um, vaccination is is an obvious one. Um, but I wonder about obesity as a low-hanging fruit. Um, what you know? Are there really very you know, I know a lot of people who have successfully given up smoking, um, but I don't know many uh, obese people who have successfully become non-obese. And similarly, I don't really know a lot of government measures that have proven to be highly effective in a policy sense at reducing obesity. On the other hand, um, recently The Economist published uh, a leader saying that the... Um, the new obesity treatments, such as um, semaglutides, GLP-1 inhibitors, are highly effective in reducing obesity and could have a huge impact on cancer from, from what you're saying, not to mention any impact on cardiovascular disease or other um, morbidities. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if you'd have any comment on that, especially taking into account um, Professor Steele's comment and that, to begin with that we can't treat ourselves out of this problem. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? I hope the mic is okay. I'm just looking at the IT guy behind. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You are right. So no country in the world has discovered a magic tool to decrease obesity. It's not a low hanging fruit. That's a difficult one. The new drugs are very interesting products, and I think we have two in the market now. Novo Nordics is uh, has today a budget. Uh, uh, um, uh, a surplus of money per year, which is higher to the entire budget of the Danish state. And this is because of the new drugs, uh, the, the, the new drug that they, they, are, they are producing. It's a very new drug, so we don't know long-term effects yet. It seems to be indeed quite effective in, in suppressing appetite, and it seems that it has a potential to decrease about 10% of the body weight if used consistently for at least one year. It's not my specialty. I will dig into this, but I'm not ready to comment on the details of the metabolism and the potential impact on cancer. But there is hope that it might be a, a very interesting product. To The question is, there are only two companies producing as per today. The, the uh, drugs are uh, licensed, I believe, in the European market, at least for diabetes, not for the control of obesity. And the diabetic persons, they have most benefit of the drug. But using the drug in diabetics, it has been, become evident that there was a substantial decrease in weight. Therefore, people are buying it off-label, that means not by prescription, just to reduce obesity. And the main market is the US. So they are basically absorbing, so sucking all the, all the product to the US market, leaving the other patients that really would need it more, which are the diabetics, without it. So there is, there is an a, a issue here with the demand supply of uh, these drugs. There is a second company, I, I, I hope I'm not saying something wrong, it's Lilly that is sort of producing a, a second product, which is not exactly the same, but uh, is in the same family of products, so which will maybe uh, manage to, to balance the market, but it's not going to be immediate. The, uh, the, the Danish company is building a new factory in France, uh, south of Paris, which and the factory will start producing it by end of this year. So I think by next year we are going to see more people being able to use it, and then we need to follow up and see if there are uh, side effects, and if there are cancer side effects, or to the positive or to the negative part. So we just don't know yet. Can you resolve the obesity problem worldwide with this drug? Probably not. Probably you can decrease to people that have a, can afford it because it costs a fortune and the patent will last 20 years. You can decrease likely up to 10% of body weight, 
But as with all interventions for obesity, people tend to rebound unless they would keep going using this very expensive drug for life, which I don't know if it's uh, is an option. What is really interesting is that the, the discovery of these this compounds lead probably to the discovery of other compounds, which will in indicate how you can control appetite with relatively uh, side effects, relatively few side effects. I, I was carried on by the drug, sorry. <laughs> it's, so it's fascinating, right? But I mean, sorry, there's no country has sorted out the obesity pandemic. The best is to prevent it, and how you prevent it is in children. It's, it's uh, making the diet of the children balanced with less ultra-processed food, mostly based on plant diet and, and not processed food, and increased physical activity, but it's really the diet which is the key. And all countries are going in the, in the wrong direction. No country has sorted this out. Okay, so some hope, but uh, please. Thank you. Um, you had a very interesting slide there, and you said maybe we'll speak about it a little bit later. Um, when it comes to um, United States, they had uh, almost the same amount of cancer incidents, but less deaths from cancer. Could you please share your thoughts on why that is the case? Yeah. So there was a slide where I show you the proportion, or the, the, the proportion of cancer cases and the proportion of mortality. And uh, for Asia, it's 50% incidence, 60% of mortality. For Europe, it's about the same, it's 20, about 2020. And for the US, it's 20 incidence and 14% mortality. Why that difference? Why people in the, in the US have lower mortality as compared to incidence than in Europe, for instance? There are many explanations to that. And uh, I will give you just a few to start the discussions. One is that many cancers are which, are, which would not be ever detected if you would detect based on symptoms, are detected in the US and they enter the statistics of cancer where in Europe they, that would not happen. For example, in the US you have a massive uh, screening for prostate cancer based on PSA, prostate specific antigen. If you measure PSA in men above a certain age, there is a very large amount of, of positives, people that have an increased PSA, but that actually will never develop a full-blown prostate cancer. And in the US, they tend, to they, they tend to biopsy those men and include them in the, in the cancer statistics. There are also many other early diagnoses of cancer that they include in the statistics. So there is a little bit of an overinflation of incident cases that elsewhere in the world would never be detected. And what this happens is that when, when the cancer is not really a cancer, it's a very initial cancer, enters in the statistics, until that cancer develops to a full, either they never develop to a full-blown full cancer or they are treated ag aggressively uh, early, so the mortality is lower because the cancers are detected extremely early. That's one explanation. The other explanation is that the end of life in the US is much more aggressive than in Europe and in other countries. That means that in, in Europe, or in, in the countries in Europe that I worked with at least, at, at a certain point, you stop aggressive treatment. So you, you let life take its course and you let the patient die a dignified dead, but you allow the patient to die. In the US, you keep pushing. And there's, there's so much litigation, so many doctors and many health, and the healthcare system is also a commercial one, so they gain a lot of money in keeping the patient alive, even if the quality of life is very low, and patients are just hospitalized and not really having a, a, a good quality of life. So I think these are at least these two uh, things explain a partially, the discrepancy. In the back, please. Well, thank you for such an informative talk. Um, so I guess it's kind of a naive question, but what would be sort of a timeline if, for example, you have a carcinogen of interest, what would be kind of a time frame that you would aim for uh, for doing these investigations at the EIR, EIRCT? I, I assume you are talking about the monographs, right? Yes. When, 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 what is enough evidence for us to write a monograph? 
to make a systematic evaluation of the evidence. It's basically when you have articles uh, in animal models, in cell models, and in humans. Uh, that usually takes quite a lot of time to accumulate because we need to have a substantial amount of evidence. What happens if we evaluate things too early when you only have a couple of studies here and there? Most of substances would be classified as cl class three because there is not enough quality and quantity of studies. So we usually tend to wait quite a long time until there is a bulk of studies which is uh, sufficient. So there is a group of experts that, this, that suggests priorities in order uh, every five years. And how do they take that decision? They take that decision based on the amount of the literature, the quality of the literature, and the indication that the substance might indeed be carcinogenic. So uh, usually we only go for an evaluation when we, are, we have a very strong suspicion that the substance might cause cancer or the other way around, that you want to exclude that idea so that people can, uh, can, be more, uh, can use it without any, any uh, major issues. In th for this is mainly for occupational exposure. So chemicals related to occupational exposures that we try to exclude the carcinogenicity of it. So do we have questions from our online audience? Um, so we have an online question which is asking, what is the reasoning behind night shift work being a probable carcinogen? Yeah, so sleep is a very ancient mechanism in, in mammals and in other animals, and it regulates the, your hormonal system in a, in, in a quite precise way. And shift work tends to deregulate the, what we call the circadian rhythm, and, th and things to, uh, tends to cause a hormonal imbalance that might lead to the occurrence of hormonal-related cancers. And there, there were studies published on breast cancer and prostate cancer, particularly these two, two cancer types, where there is some evidence uh, that they might cause cancer. Uh, it's controversial. Uh, there are many studies also showing that this is not the case. So the, I think the, there is still some controversy. Does it cause cancer, yes or no? And if yes, what to do about it? Because for some professions, let's take nurses working in, in uh, emergency settings or medical doctors that need to work 24 hours some, sometimes. Uh, we don't have solutions for that. But they, there are several studies and also animal studies and cellular models indicating that the, the uh, uh, disruption in circadian rhythm is not good for you. Uh, Bill. You, you've talked about exposure to exogenous uh, things. Can, can I take you a stage further? Because it seems to me that, uh, maybe I'm wrong, that people get exposed to these um, carcinogens, and some of them seem to be quite inherently resistant. And they're a bit of a problem because you put up the individual who's drunk uh, himself for 30 or 40 years, and yet he's healthy and wealthy at 91, and yet someone who's uh, drunk an awful lot less doesn't do it. So it comes down to individual susceptibility. And I'm going to ask you whether or not the extreme, of course, I suppose, is hereditary cancer, where you know that there's a specific oncogene there that's go going to cause things, and in most cases you can say. But what about... Uh, anti-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes and so forth. I mean, is science making any progress there so that they can identify those people for whatever reason, DNA repair or whatever, seem to be able to protect themselves against uh, cancers. And therefore, if you was able to screen those people, then perhaps you'd be able to reassure them that they're not going to have a problem in the future. Thank you so much for this question. And I, I didn't almost, I believe, I did not mention genes at all. I did not mention oncogenes. I did not mention none because I wanted really to put the focus on pre what, you, what you can do or your family can do. Uh, and usually genes is relatively little you can do. That's it. Either you are born with it or you ad acquire it and then too bad you deal with it, right? So it, it's, it's more complex. 
there is most definitely a percentage of cancers which are caused by high, what we call high penetrance genes. That means you inherited them and then your risk of cancer is very elevated. And these are, for the example, the, the cancers associated with BRCA1, BRCA2, which are related to breast cancer, or ovarian cancer, uh, and, and other cancer types. Also, there are mutations in, in a, a gene which is called P53, which encodes for a protein called P53, which increases rather dramatically the risk of colorectal cancer, and there are other genes that cause endometrial cancer, and so on and so forth. So for many of these known high penetrance genes, there are tests that can be done when there is evidence from the family tree, when you do the family story of the patient, you, you can actually quite clearly see that there is a, there is a, a family history which is substantial. And then for this, I, I believe in, in the UK as well, I'm not very familiar how things, but there are specific clinics and there are specific population programs where you screen the patient and you screen the family. Also, once you have a relatively young person that have a cancer diagnosis, usually you screen it because you, you might think that the, that might be related to a to a high penetrance genes or to a combination of low penetrance genes, but that together increase the risk. In some cases, some preventative measures can be proposed, like the excision of the organ or use of certain chemical substances, chemotherapy or other preventative uh, hormonal therapy to decrease the cancer risk, but not always. There's tremendous progress being made in recent decades in the biology of cancer and in particular in the role of the immune system in, in cancer development, but also in the response to therapy. And also there are many new therapies now uh, targeting the immune system. And it's a new paradigm altogether. So I think that until when I was trained as a medical doctor, it was chemotherapy. So we would give chemotherapy or we would get, give hormone therapy in some cases, and that was the arsenal. Now the arsenal is much broader. And also the, the new developments in genetic indicate that you, you can also genotype the type of tumor. And sometimes you can uh, prescribe the drugs which are very specific to the mutations from existing in that. So it is a revolution in the way we diagnose and we treat cancer that it, and is evolving very rapidly. We're coming fairly close to the end, but I think time for one. Uh, Talia, do we have any uh, any other questions? Are there any other? So, one final question. Sorry. Yeah, just a quick question. Given that we know about prostate cancer, the, the figure that you showed, uh, how preventable cancers are, uh, when you the, the slides show zero percent for prostate cancer, uh, isn't that correct? That if uh, like some preventive measure happens, like when the, there's properitia, when the prostate gets larger, it's controlled, it may cause less cancer or more cancer. And it yeah. was interesting for me that no yeah. zero was there. Yeah. No, it, it's, not, it's not exactly zero, it's a little bit higher than zero, so there's a little, tiny bit that we know that we can prevent or detect early. So people that have a very important family history of prostate cancer that have sort of, it's quite clear that there's a hereditary component for those families, for those men, they can be uh, tested for PSA. PSA is prostate specific antigen, is a hormone. But they can also do imaging testing a little bit earlier and, and repeatedly. So to, to see if they, they are developing a, a, a exam. However, these tests are not recommended to the general population because when you apply them to the general population, you have many people that turn up positive and you end up treating a lot of people and the benefit is not clear in terms of side effects and also in the prolongation of life. So it means for people that have a very clear family story, it's recommended the screening and early detection, but not for the, for the general population. There is an effect of obesity, but it, it explains a relatively small number of cases of prostate cancer. There is a lot of research ongoing on prostate cancer. The European Union is recommending screening now. It's a, they, they, they recommend that countries start a, a 
pilot tests on screening, but combining PSA and imaging, because the imaging tests now are becoming much better, and it might be that in the future, the combination of, of uh, biological tests with imaging will be hopefully the solution to find those patients that would benefit because their lesions are, are growing faster than they would otherwise in men that have their prostate cancer, but it grows so slowly that treating it does not really add any benefit to the, to the length of life or the quality of life. Okay. So I think we're now at half past seven, so we should uh, draw the proceedings to a close. Um, I would personally like to thank you for a, a wonderful lecture and uh, for also for answering some pretty challenging questions. And uh, I would like to call on one of our directors, Professor Annie Anderson, to give a vote of thanks. So I've been invited to give a few words of thanks, and there's lots of thanks to be given. Firstly, to you all for coming out tonight or sitting in front of your, your laptops uh, to come and hear this, this very, very good talk indeed. And thanks to the RSE for both organising and hosting tonight's meeting. It's, yeah, thank you very much. We've been fortunate to hear Dr. Vardapas give an excellent presentation about the complexity and challenges of cancer research for cancer prevention, and really presenting a very good case as to why we need to prioritize cancer research, why we need better screening, and why we need both better primary and secondary prevention measures. The arguments are there, the numbers are there. So thank you for your very insightful work, particularly around international perspectives. And cancer is a disease that is neither rare nor confined to high-income countries. And I think you made that point really, really well. Sometimes sitting here in Scotland, we can forget that international perspective. And that's why we need those figures. And figures like 19.3 million in 2020 new cases rising to 28.4 by 2040 is just staggering. And I think that's the sort of figure that we, we won't forget. And neither can we ignore the statistics about how much disease reduction could be achieved through changes in lifestyle and vaccination measures. And 1.3 million cancer preventable deaths in, in Europe and that's 44% of cases in women and 33% in men. The opportunities there absolutely abound. And of course, changing lifestyle isn't just about the responsibility for the individual, it's about our society, and it's about government and government policies. In Scotland, of course, we've had some excellent examples of policy action, including minimal alcohol pricing and some very good uh, tobacco measures. And I remain forever hopeful that diet will one day become a real focus of this government. And I'm waiting, <laughs> been waiting for a long time. Thank you, Elizabeth, for taking the time to travel to Scotland. And I hope you'll have the opportunity to enjoy some time in Edinburgh. And now I would like to ask you all to join me in a big applause for a truly wonderful presentation. Thank you.